Dear all, welcome to the Anamed Library Talks organized by the Anamed Library. I'm Defne Giyar, Anamed Library's branch librarian. Today, Anamed Library Talks hosts uh, two distinguished speakers, Evan Croft and Noor Sabars Khan. The title of this talk is Recovering Collective Memory, Tracing Historical Collecting in the Manuscripts of the Tiflis Collection at the University of Michigan Library. This talk will focus on the Tiflis collections, provenance, and the futuring of the manuscripts themselves, and the historical collection traced within this collection. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Evan Croft is a librarian and curator of Islamic manuscripts at the University of Michigan Library. As a specialist of Islamic codicology, and Arabic manuscript culture. Her particular interests include writing material, especially paper, structural repairs, reading, and collecting practices of the Ottoman era, as well as the significance of pictograms and other visual contents for Sufi knowledge transmission. Uh, Noor Sobers will be the moderator of today's talk, uh, and she will join us uh, in a while. Uh, she's currently the director of uh, Khan Documentation Center. Sobers Khan is trained to work with manuscripts in Arabic, Persian, Ottoman Turkish, and Urdu. She has been curator for collections from the Ottoman Empire and Turkey um, at the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar, and lead curator for South Asia at the British Library. Her research interests include uh, early Ottoman slavery, Safavid and Mughal albums, Qajar era visual troops, and the circulation of manuscripts in the early modern Islamic world, and also digital humanities. At this point, I would like to remind our audience that their microphones are automatically turned off. Uh, you may type your questions in the chat sections, and at the end of the talk, the moderator will ask your questions uh, to the speaker. So now, um, passing the word to Evan Croft. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much, Daphne, for the invitation and for your impeccable organization and coordination and for, for all of the support. Um, it's really my honor to be here with, Thank you. Uh, with all of you. So I will share now um, my screen. Um, to take us into the uh, presentation. And in the chat, I will share with everyone um, a link which uh, should take you to this uh, slide file so that, that you can engage with the material and explore throughout the, the talk. Um, so I uh, would like to just begin with um, some invitations and gratitude. Uh, so you've made this space to be here. And I hope that um, you will be able to take something uh, away decent um, of use for, for your work or even compelling for a new project. And I especially appreciate those of you who can see or feel some tie to the communities represented by these manuscripts. And please know I recognize your experiences and your interests, and I hope you will freely share your questions and your insights. And um, I know I will be the richer to, to hear from you. So, of course, I come to these questions that I hope to explore in the talk from a position of tremendous privilege, being at an, a not exceptional <laughs> settler colonial institution, I mean, right, academic institution, and, and um, access to the collection, of course, in my role as custodian and, and curator. And I hope to, to to leverage that um, generously in this um, in this discussion. Um, so this talk 
such <laughs> such as it is, very, very rough hewn still, is emerging from a work in progress. Again, still, uh, still un unpolished. Um, but I take um, tremendous in inspiration um, and that to the work of archival scholars in thinking about in thinking about these ideas. Um, to think about manifestations of cultural memory, to think about the possibility of recovering collective memory, communal identity, and even provenance as a tool for um, community inclusion. Simai Ahmad, Jeanette Bastian, Michelle Caswell, other archival science scholars have um, explored these ideas in really compelling ways, and I encourage you to explore their work if you are not already familiar with them. In addition to that, I'm always taking inspiration from the work of Native scholar and anthropolog anthropologist um, Margaret Bruchak, who um, has advocated for restorative methodologies, um, including tracing object histories across contemporary institutional collections, contemporary institutional displacements and removals from original context um, in an attempt to recover, again, recover what can um, be understood of knowledge, interpretation, um, a concept of, of the object through reconnection, reconnection with communities. Um, and so in this talk, I hope that you will consider some of these ideas with me in thinking about how collections are formed, um, collections as a displacement, um, what difference does that make, and um, and what um, what can emerge if we explore provenance, if we trace um, these histories, and and bring some uh, recovery to. <laughs> to what is, is embedded there. So, Tiflis Collection. <laughs> the Tiflis Collection is currently preserved at the University of Michigan Library. It's part of the Special um, uh, Collections Research Center Islamic Manuscripts Collection. Uh, so physically, this means um, being obviously carefully stored um, in, in the Hatcher Graduate Library. Um, very fortunately, there has been investment in the cataloging uh, of the collection, as well as the digitization, um, so that detailed descriptions are accessible in online platforms, data is accessible in online platforms, such as it is. Of course, there are limitations with any uh, cataloging structure and, uh, and de description approach in terms of language, in terms of um, uh, arrangement. Um, but this is why many approaches are, are important and many spaces and, um, and discussions and invitations for interpretation and understanding are important. Uh, so the manuscripts actually can be consulted online, such, such as that is. Um, they can be downloaded, they can be browsed, and you will see throughout the file, if you have had a chance to look at it, there are links. And some of these links are pointing to uh, sources for some additional explanation, but many of them are, are taking you into the library catalog where you will find the descriptions and you will find links to um, the digitized manuscripts. And I hope that you will follow those and at your leisure even outside of this time and explore. And if if you are <laughs> feeling generous, share share back with us what, what you are understanding and what you are seeing and what you were working um, out. Um, in these materials and these historical collections that are um, uh, that are there to in them. So um, the collection is also accessible for consultation um, in the reading room. Um, that is physical consultation. So uh, we make the manuscripts um, available that way also. Um, and also, um, the manuscripts are uh, accessible in teaching. Um, this is mainly with university students, but also community events and then um, in exhibition. Um, as I mentioned, 153 of the 163 volumes of the Tiflis 
collection have been fully digitized. They're openly available for, for consultation um, digitally. And very fortunately, in the current uh, custodial arrangement of these materials, uh, there is investment in curatorial and cust custodial expertise for, for uh, preservation and management of the, of the collection. Though there's a lot of labor, I mean, even in the, this project I've been working on, just maintaining the descriptions is, um, yeah, such a labor. <laughs> and there is always something new which is emerging. Oh, and always uh, typos that, <laughs> that that are that are coming. So, yeah. So a profile of the collection again to uh, offer this um, as a space to explore explore the collection. Um, so um, the. 163 volumes have have been assigned these numbers they carry more than 290 texts and there are still more um excerpts and distinct prayer texts and invocations and litanies that are found in the in the volumes um to further complicate things there are a couple of works of tafsir which are actually in multiple volumes and then there are a, a, a couple of um uh, works that have that are multi-volume but have been assigned multiple numbers. So there is a multi-volume mushaf, and then there is a a collection of um, fetvala that actually have multiple numbers, even though they are one work. Of course, um, the vast majority of those more than two hundred ninety texts are in Arabic. Um, there are six texts in Ottoman Turkish, and then one text, a diwan of selected uh, poetry, uh, in Persian. Um, the texts address topics of Islamic jurisprudence, um, both um, usul al-fiqh works and also a compendia of legal opinions, Arabic language and linguistics, um, various dimensions, rhetoric, dialectic, theology, belief, um, or aqaid, um, prayer and devotion, um, hadith collections, as well as commentaries um, and sciences, and then Quranic exegesis, Sufism, and so forth. And I've listed these roughly in um, order of their representation within the collection. So um, what you've actually find um, uh, richest in the collection in terms of representation will be the, the jurisprudence. And then after that, the Arabic language and linguistics and, and so on. Um, Naturally, given the subject matter, many of these treatises are presented or appear with their um, commentaries and super commentaries, um, sometimes interlinear, very often on the margin, sometimes in multiple layers on the margin. So in terms of manuscript culture, most of the volumes um, are a manageable, sort of affordable uh, size. Um, the text blocks are, are made up primarily of watermark papers, which are almost entirely European imports, though um, regional non-watermark papers are actually used in 37 of the volumes. Covers are of leather with Ottoman ornaments or even um, framed uh, with marble papers and leather or, or decorative papers um, or other uh, colored papers and leather. The preferred scripts are um, what you might expect, Nasahan Talik, um, in a range of uh, regional styles. And in almost all manuscripts, a contrasting ink, usually in a red color, has been used to ease the reading or the navigation through uh, the volume by marking um, uh, transitional headings, keywords, passages being commented upon in order to uh, stand out. And that can be by writing um, these in the red ink or, or overlining them. And uh, this manuscript, there is an example um, of a, <laughs> a later reader, actually, who is the copyist, in fact, coming back to his copy to read <laughs> sometime later, uh, describing here in this note. So he's using the red ink to write his note, and he is indicating what he has that what he, what he has done with the red ink is actually to distinguish the text being commented on, but from the commentary um, around it. So we see this, um, these kinds of uh, practices. 
There are more than 30 manuscripts that include some more elaborate ornaments that might incorporate gold or colors, a vegetal geometric forms, um, even for the arrangement of glosses. And since we were discussing glosses, I will just point to this one. Um, so you can see we have multiple layers of commentaries here. And then we also have the interlinear uh, glossing, which usually refers to particular words or phrases to clarify their meanings. And then the more extensive commentary is appearing in the in the margins. So. If you would like to see other examples of the um, illumination, um, here is an example of an illuminated uh, title piece. Um, and so, and you can also see annotations of former owners um, surrounding and, and very distinctly marking this, um, this title piece. Um, so there are instances of um, illuminated and very richly um, uh, luxuriant manuscripts within the within the collection. They are not the majority, but they are they are present. <clears throat> so there are other elements of manuscript culture. Some of these may be familiar to some of you. Some of them may be some <laughs> mind numbingly familiar to some of you. Some of them may be completely new to you and and of interest to you. But I just wanted to um, to give a chance um, uh, to explore in case they are um, familiar to you but still pleasant or or new to you entirely so the use of the the ruling board so this is actually the technique which the the copyists will use to mark blind rules in the paper to have a guide for writing so we can see this actually this very faint line which is here behind um, the line uh, of writing um, so we can see the use of that um, there are many instances of scribal verses. This is an example of a line of <laughs> scribal verse. Um, and again, if you follow this link, you will see lists of manuscripts in which these appear. There are um, many instances of collation marks or collation statements, which refers to the process of checking the copy against other manuscripts and indicating variants, indicating um, uh, in case of any need for correction um, that has been a mistake has been introduced to uh, to reference that um, also the order um, of the text of course to be sure it is in place um, and so there are many instances of how um, the copyists are approaching that and then um, in this case there is an example of a manuscript where the copyist actually within the call phone has indicated that they they have uh, transcribed this uh, text working from three manuscripts and then uh, collated it from the same um, and and they go on <laughs> with some scribal verses and then concluding with um, an indication of um, when they uh, completed their work. There are also um, other interesting things like borrowing notes or loan notes. Um, so where uh, someone either to whom the manuscript belongs or someone, you, I mean, it is uh, very often this, will indicate that someone has borrowed the manuscript um, from them. Um, some instances of uh, contents listings, various approaches to listing out the contents of the volumes, which again might change if they are anthologies and they're being separated and and, and sort of refashioned, brought together with other works. So here's one approach. It looks very much um, like a tabular format and, they, and they're becoming even more um, definitively <laughs> uh, tabular. Um, and very often page numbers will be referenced. And of course, this is uh, for, for utility navigation um, and especially in works which are more dense or um, or topically oriented, and especially works of um, you know, jurisprudence, which may be organized in a topical way that will be of interest. There are also birth notices, and I <laughs> and, and and matters of social life for the for the readers and the owners of the manuscripts. These are in Turkish, um, 
yeah, very sweet. We indicate the year on the name of the child and so forth. We see also um, uh, death notices and other kinds of notices related to um, historical events that might be indicated. And there are also um, uh, protective devices and, and treatments um, recommended, for example, in this um, manuscript, which um, is a prayer book, a copy of Al Hizb al Azam, Dala al Al Khairat. And at the conclusion of the volume, there is this uh, ma a magic square of Duh, which actually includes an, indi an indication of um, what should be done and that it is um, tried and tested and effective for um, uh, for easing the situation of a of a woman who who is in a hard and um, uh, uh, distressing uh, labor. <laughs> so uh, we find these sorts of things as well. Also, in the same um, vein or similar vein, um, the kibikach uh, or ya kibikach ya hafiz invocations. Um, and the uh, seal of Solomon, um, which again are powerful and um, protective um, devices. Okay, so the, and these are all within the Tiflis collection. These are, I mean, these are indicative of broader context, manuscript cultural context, but um, we they, they are present. They are represented in the Tiflis collection. Um, so uh, for for the the date range of the collection, the scope of the collection, um, ninety one of the one hundred sixty three volumes have some explicit dating, which is again usually provided in what's called a call form, um, which usually has a distinctive shape. We've already looked at a couple of them, um, but here is just another example. The distinctive shape is very often an inverted triangle or a trapezoid. Um, so this is indicative of that, and we have some scribal verses here, and then we have the conclusion of the call fun as well. Um, and again, it is usually describing the circumstances of the production of the copy, when the work was completed and by whom, and if we are lucky, where they were and when they were, and if there were other circumstances related to, um, to, the, to that um, transcription, such as study with a particular teacher, um, working from a particular exemplar, that sort of thing. Um, the range and date for the Tiflis collection is actually pretty broad. So from as far as even the explicitly dated manuscripts from the turn of the 15th century all the way to the mid 19th century. Um, and three volumes could be a little bit earlier. Um, this is an example. This is an example of one here. Um, but the majority of the of the copies are actually from the 17th or from the 18th century. Um, and there are relatively few volumes across the entire collection, which are from the 19th century, which is interesting. Um, and <laughs> we'll get into why that's interesting in, uh, in, in a little bit. So in terms of geographies, um, and please excuse the um, labeled map, um, there are explicit uh, places of copying mentioned um, across the manuscripts, and those include Erzurum, Stambul, um, Damascus, Erzincan, Ederne, Amasya, uh, Harvard, Kiles, Kars, Trabzon, Tokat, Chemger, Pachan, um, even Mecca. And for Pachan, um, Marashal is another uh, possibility for this particular um, small, uh, small place, small locality. Um, Mecca, of course, has distorted the the <laughs> the scope of of the map here. <laughs> so, otherwise, we would be in a in a relatively uh, compact area. But of course, we we um, we um, we include Mecca, and the and the copyists were um, were traveling there and working there and indicating um, their <clears throat> their work. Uh, so. Additional places associated with copyists that we could read through their nisbas, for example, it's a it's a um, it's a reach. Um, these are mere associations, not necessarily do do they have to do with when or where the manuscript 
um, itself was produced, but these are associations to to understand uh, communities. Um, and of course, some of them again will be more communal and some of them will be associated with uh, geography. So um, those include some of those that you see here, Skopje, Nablus, Homs, et cetera, other, other places. Um, and then um, 31 of the volumes, um, oh, sorry, all, 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 but 31 of the volumes <laughs> bear notes or seals indicating that they were placed in endowed collections or foundation libraries. Uh, um, and so for the most part, those those can be identified as located in Erzurum, Erzunjan, or vicinity. And these are contemporary names. Um, so basically, uh, and this area will be the focus for <laughs> much of the much of the conversation uh, later. And naming naming is is very important. <laughs> So manuscript communities that are represented. So there, there are many named copyists, um, copyists that are identifying themselves. Um, 77 of the manuscripts have these. Um, uh, for example, we have this um, Ahmed ibn Dalil Arzanjani who was working in Mecca um, from a very particular manuscript. He actually indicates um, that this manuscript um, belonged um to let's see this al basri um sorry i don't want to delay the connection so he is indicating actually that you know he's working um from this copy um and where he was um uh, when he when he was copying it um and in a, in a very in a very particular madrasa there, and then that he took it from again this this copy that that um, belonged to um, this al Basri that um, we mentioned. So um, four of the manuscripts have more than one copyist identified. And, and though in some of those cases, they are composite, they're, they're different components are produced at wildly different times. And in other cases, not um, more of a you know, more of a contemporary collaboration. Um, more than 60 uh, former, that should be former owners are, are noted. Sometimes they are accompanied Sometimes their notes are accompanied by, by a seal um, impression, as in this case, when it loads, there it is. Um, and uh, this is the, an example uh, that is a note for Jinnit Zad Ismail Muhyim Muhammad Gharab of Erzurum. In seven manuscripts, the copyist is also identified as being a former owner. So the copyist would have produced the manuscript for um, himself. Um, in a few cases, there are collators and readers that have left their names in notes and seals. And in um, some of them are easier to identify than others. Some of them, they're still very ambiguous, only a single name, very little else. Um, but some of them are more detailed, some of them are indicating dates, indicating places, they give um, a fuller account of their name. Um, and this is incredibly rich um, information for tracing uh, histories in particular and, um, and recovering these um, embedded memories. 132 of the manuscript volumes include notes or seals indicating they were deposited in these uh, pious foundation libraries. And um, in some cases, it's actually possible to trace back from the endowed collections to earlier owners or endowments. In, in, um, and I will, I will spare you my spreadsheets, but <laughs> there are... There are, um, in many cases, many cases, um, the uh, founders of the endowed libraries 
were uh, sourcing for um, the endowment from the collections of earlier respected um, scholars. And this would have been uh, accessible for them, uh, a, natural, a, natural, a natural source. So here is a list of those um, uh, um, there are some that are not identified. Um, it could be that the uh, statement indicating the Vakif actually is, is lost, came, came away from the, the manuscript, or it could be, there could be another explanation. Um, but it's not, it's not at all unlikely that, um, you know, that a, that a uh, flyleaf or, or folio would come loose. Um, in several of these cases, the, um, the manuscripts are not whole or complete. They are lacking at the opening or at, at the close. Um, so here is an initial, um, an initial list of these. And again, just some indication if you want to um, explore them further. Here we also have uh, Vakif actually uh, sourcing from an earlier uh, Vak. So that is what this means here. Um, Yes, Cholu Ali Pasha is represented in this singular manuscript. A um, little bit of a surprise, and I was checking the deftar, and there may be a tie to this, maybe a portion of another manuscript listed in the deftar, but um, it's mysterious. This manuscript is one of those which is lacking. Um, so maybe that it was um lifted out but how how it came to be with the rest of these manuscripts is something to explore um so these are again relatively um limited in terms of representation from from for these collections um however um there is substantial representation for for for, for these um collections these libraries um again most can be tied directly to Erzinjan or Erzurum, or uh, elsewhere in, in the vicinity, we'll see. Um, and as, as you see, I'm 65 manuscripts from this um, uh, library of established by Janet Zalda Abdul Adib, and 46 um, from a, a library um, established by uh, Gumish Hanavi. So here is the an, an example of this statement, um, as you might find it in detail. Um, this is for the Janet Zade Abdul Adib walk. Um, and this has been pasted on um, the opening folio of a manuscript over some, probably trying to find the uh, <laughs> most accessible area um, in the midst of the many annotations. And it includes, um, in this case, actually quite a bit of detailed information. There are the standard formulas regarding the, the removal. Um, and, and, and then there is actually the indication of the, of the guarantor and, um, and the Vakif um, giving his name. Um, and, that, and he is a, a, a Qadi in um, Erzurum, and then in, indicating the date. And his, uh, this is his uh, seal impression. So again, most extensively represented are the uh, collection that we were just looking um, at this statement, and also um, that of um, Yumish Hanabi, um, who is a well-known and <laughs> well-known scholar and, and Sufi Sheikh of the Nakhshbandi Khalidi suborder. Um, so Gimish Hanavi, we we'll spent some time with Gimish Hanavi. Gimish Hanavi wrote and taught extensively before establishing a tech care in Istanbul um, and his own <laughs> suborder as well. Um, he also traveled. Um, he spent a number of years in Egypt and he taught many, many students and he initiated many, many khalifa. He apparently also, I'm just adjusting my Zoom here, um, established a printing press and a, a later registered uh, foundation library in Istanbul. 
which was transferred to the Sulaymania um, in 1925 at the closure of the lodges. And he uh, also generously established three extremely large, like something like 18,000 uh, volumes across these three libraries in Weibert, Of and Rizet. Uh, Gumish Hanavi endowed manuscripts can be recognized by this large seal, uh, which has been published um, by Kurt and Berefka from a manuscript which is now in the Sulaymania. So, <clears throat> wonderfully, the uh, new edition of their publication is available online, um, open access. This is from their new publication, um, which includes um, Arabic. And of, of course, thanks to the <laughs> tremendous labor um, of our uh, of our colleagues, um, we can also view an, a record for um, for this uh, seal in the uh, new uh, seal database. So um, at Michigan are preserved forty six volumes with this seal. And all are now in the Tiflis collection. Um, the composition is of this um, Yunush Hanavi collection, you might say, is similar to the broader Tiflis collection, um, with in again order order of um, descending order of uh, presence. I got it: uh, prayer and devotion, many many prayer books, um, Arabic grammar. Um, rhetoric, dialectic, some philosophy, um, jurisprudence, naturally, tafsir, uh, hadith, and Sufism, as well as astronomy, mathematics, and lexicology. Um, there is a slightly different date distribution, and there are several composite volumes. Still, more than more than um, sixty percent of the of the manuscripts are are seventeenth century or eighteenth century, um, but proportionately more are coming earlier or later. There are there are many most most actually of the nineteenth century manuscripts in the Tiflis collection actually come from the Gumish Hanavi work library. So. Um, very generous uh, contribution from Yusuf Sagar had, in addition to um, exploring the establishment and the composition and the operation of these uh, foundation libraries, he has traced their fates. <laughs> um, some of the manuscripts were transferred to Library of the Trustee, the Mutavelli um, Al Hajj Usman Effendi in Guneja. The um, and they can, you know, the, the seal can can be seen there. He mentioned seeing seeing the seal and um and some of them. The um Ruse library, um, the building is apparently no longer standing and the whereabouts of the books are unconfirmed. Um the library building at Off still stands. You can find images of it in uh, news articles um, and and so forth um online. Uh, at least as of uh, 2014, I haven't I haven't uh, had this space to be investigating um, its current whereabouts uh, or current uh, status. Um, and according to the uh, local reports, uh, the books were transferred to Ankara for safekeeping. There were some concerns of theft apparently. Um, also, according to trustee records. The library in Baybart was plundered by the Russians during World War I, and the books were taken to Tbilisi, that is Tiflis. So <laughs> could then the 46 manuscripts now at Michigan have come from the library established by Gumish Hanavi at Baybart? Could this be um, the particular library actually that is associated with this um, box seal and, and, and collection represented here? I think you can imagine where, where we are going. So um, let's think more um, about an, the acquisition and provenance for the Tiflis collection in order to, uh, to address that uh, question. So um, I will say uh, in, a, in a flash, unsurprisingly, <laughs> 
it involves the British Museum. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very obnoxiously. Um, this is actually pasted on the front cover of a manuscript um, and was applied before, um, before reaching the university where this obnoxious mark was, was placed. Um, everyone leaving their mark. So the British Museum, the manuscripts of the Tiflis collection were purchased by the University of Michigan uh, so this was a purchase from the trustees of the British Museum in 1924. And this was an arrangement that was orchestrated by uh, University Professor Francis Vary Kelsey. You may be familiar with him as an archaeologist, very respected, uh, sorry, classicist, um, uh, who was also active in, um, in archaeology and um, antiquities. He um, expanded the university's holdings in uh, papyri, um, manuscripts and also antiquities and the um, Kelsey Museum of Archaeology at the University of Michigan is named for him. The manuscripts were actually offered um, by um, the, this selection, the Tiflis collection, uh, was offered and prepared by the British Museum to supplement Michigan's lot in the so-called Abdel Hamid cooperative purchase. And you may you may be you may be familiar with this. I know some of you are quite familiar with this story, um, in in which um, the university, the British Museum, um, and uh, Chester Beatty, having already cooperated on papyrus acquisitions, went in together to buy a collection of manuscripts that had been offered to Kelsey by the uh, well-known Kyrene antiquities dealer, Maurice Nahman, as having been bought from the late Sultan Abdel Hamid. And he gives even the, the price to suggest the, the value and the significance. Um, so he's conveying this to Kelsey in a letter, um, November of 1923. So Kelsey rather remarkably, he accepted <laughs> this claimed association with King Abdul Hamid and took it up as a point of appeal um, with the other potential purchasers and with the university um, librarian who in turn um, persuaded the other administrators. So they were really leaning into this, uh, to this supposed provenance um, and, and association. Um, Kelsey of course had many reasons for that. It was in his interest to, to cultivate in his acquisitions interest to cultivate this relationship with Nahman. And also he was very much out of his depth with this acquisition. He did not read these languages. He was not familiar with these manuscript cultures. And in fact, he was heavily, heavily, heavily relying on the expertise of the British Museum to, to even consider um, such an acquisition. Um, in his persuasion, he um, he ultimately succeeded. Uh, once they could collectively establish that their expert um, had uh, re returned a favorable uh, report in, in in what they were seeing in the in the in the manuscripts, the university and the museum um, acclaimed the supposed provenance. Um, though Kelsey asked that his and the other parties' direct involvement not being mentioned in these university press releases, as it could, and he mentioned this a number of times in the correspondence, um, as it could lead to interviews that might be twisted with the potential to do our work in Egypt uh, great harm. <laughs> so Kelsey had some delicate situations that he wanted to, that he wanted to, to, keep, to keep well. He was also very active in humanitarian uh, work um, in the midst of the Armenian genocide as well. So, so here is the British Museum in their annual uh, report flaunting the purchase of um, these manuscripts and, and not really shying, although later there would be some shying away from, from, this, from this designation. So the, the claim of having come from the library of Ikhinjab Hamid is highly suspect. <laughs> there is no evidence within the manuscripts themselves confirming his ownership. This may be no surprise to you. Um, the only manuscripts with any real association are four albums 
that may have been bound in the Yildiz Palace workshop, possibly for him, possibly for someone within his family or his circle. And, and this is a link to those. And um, the university's uh, initial cataloger for the, for the collection, uh, Professor Worrell, um, as he was working to list the manuscripts for the library, he he noted, of the Abdul Hamid manuscripts, I have cataloged temporarily 116 numbers. Most of them seem actually to have belonged to the Sultan's family. In other words, he wasn't finding any evidence of the Sultan. It had to be, had to be some, some other explanation. But Kelsey was inclined really to dismiss evidence, undermining the notion that the manuscripts had belonged to Ikhijan Hamid. So here is an example of a letter of some Voynich. Um, actually had passed along this clipping from a newspaper, and it's discussing this, the establishment of the Turkish National Library, um, and that this uh, would draw heavily on the private library of the late Sultan Abdul Hamid. Of course, there has to be this, this barb regarding um, being a great reader or not, um, uh, but noting that he collected widely and judiciously, and at the time of his de this deposition in 1909 had amassed a considerable number of rare and interesting books and manuscripts. Um, manuscripts of the greatest value were collected in Constantinople, Istanbul, in past centuries, and it is hoped to make many of them accessible to the world as a result of the new organization. And so Kelsey's remark in response to this is there is obviously a confusion. <laughs> There's obviously some confusion here regarding what is the what is the library of the late Sultan Abdul Hamid, the manuscripts that we have and so forth. There must be some confusion. There must be some mistake. Um, the British Museum um, was in this, not for purely calligraphic specimens, which are not illuminated in manuscripts of the first rank, but for texts of literary importance. And they ended up taking more than they had initially imagined. <laughs> um, and so, the university um, to sort of soften uh, that that situation was offered a supplement. Um, and the colleagues in the Department of Oriental Books and Manuscripts actually made a selection from this collection of duplicate manuscripts, which were pressed upon them by the Foreign Office without expert examination. So apparently these were manuscripts that they would not have accepted if they had been, a, this is the insinuation, they would not have accepted these manuscripts if they had been able to examine them in the field as it were um, before receiving them. And the offer was, was roughly one pound per manuscript in terms of the, in terms of the cost. Um, and so we can actually see that um, laid out here. Um, and it is Edward Edwards, um, who Kelsey thinks very high of, um, uh, who was tasked uh, with making this selection. And he was very generously, um, very generously offering to do that. Um, he uh, also listed and cataloged them. And in fact, in this uh, photograph, what you see, so this is the old card file. Some of you will know this card file. Um, and in the preparation of this card file, it seems that um, our uh, university uh, cataloger took uh, the list of Edwards and trimmed it, <laughs> trimmed out the entries and then pasted them onto cards, and then when necessary, assigned uh, new numbers. So Edwards' uh, descriptions were, were limited and actually they were very apologetic. He and, um, uh, Barnett, um, the keeper of the department, were very apologetic that the work had to be rushed and it could not be more detailed. Um, but at least the university was getting um, a good nucleus of an oriental collection um, and and getting an, an, ori an oriental library set up. So the manuscripts um, selected and assembled by um, Edwards fit very well the university's Orientalist collecting interests and, and appetites. Um, and those were focused on securing material for scholarly publication um, while it could be had. Now, um, this is just um, following the war. 
um, and the post-war poverty of Europe um, is referenced. The notion being here that um, America, the US, um, <laughs> should step into the breach and, and to quote Kelsey here, bring the resources of the materials of scholarship within the reach of American scholars who will be able to utilize them to the fullest advantage. The obligation which rests upon American scholars to take up the work which their European colleagues are unable to do is sufficiently obvious. So if the Europeans can't do it, the Americans must because scholars in the region are somehow incapable. <laughs> Complete disregard for the um, centuries of scholarship in the region and scholarly tradition. So um, this is where we see these quotes in case you, <laughs> you have an interest in self-torture later. Um, so again, uh, where, how, how did these manuscripts uh, come to the British Museum? How, were they, how did they reach, a very passive way to put it, how did they reach the British Museum? So presumably they had been pressed on the forced on the, the foreign office at uh, Tbilisi or, or Tiflis, where the British exerted substantial influence after World War I. Um, and of course, the, the Russian presence was very strong. <clears throat> um, in, uh, in this uh, area was located the Museum of the Kafkas, whose senior curator, um, Ter um, who was in post from 1914 to 1919, roughly, had reportedly during the uh, World War One, from the, Cauc the Caucasian front, in engaged in work to save and preserve monuments of Armenian culture in Western Armenia. This is a very noble um, pursuit, but but what is saved and what is preserved and what is what does it mean? What does it require to accomplish that? Um, so he was moving around um, the, the region, um, uh, and, it, and uh, again, the idea of saving from destruction um, these uh, materials. And here, here he is at the time. Um, again, this was a time of tremendous aggression, tremendous upheaval, massacres, and forced displacements. It was it was awful. Um, and um, however, I mean, to to be to be coming um, presumably with with Russian uh, protection was also um, mm, a more secure. Um, so during his expedition, he uh, supposedly explored um, Van, the citadel, um, several monasteries collected about 1,000 Armenian and several dozens of Arabic and Turkish manuscripts, uh, took measurements and photographed many monuments. Um, again, under the, the pretense of, of preserving this culture, which was again under very real threat for, for much of this, under very real threat of, of, of destruction and loss. Um, and apparently, <laughs> to, to further complicate this, it was on the order of the Russian Academy of Sciences that from 1916 on, he began sending packages with manuscripts gathered by him by the order of the AS, that is the Academy of Sciences, in the territories around the Lake Van, Erzurum, Erzinjan, etc., occupied by the Russian troops. This collection, called the Van Collection, included inter alia more than 1,000 items of Arabic manuscripts, primarily Arabic manuscripts. And this collection was ultimately described and listed by the famous Orientalist and Arabist. Krushkovsky, whom you will know as a, <laughs> a manuscript of file. Um, and in his description, he notes um, that the manuscripts were collected mainly in Turkish Armenia and Western Armenia during the operations on the Kafkas front. And he mentions that in the main, they have been copied in the region. Um, not to just not to breeze that <laughs> breeze past that. Collected is an interesting word, and then also during the operations, um, copied copied in the region um, in uh, Anatolia in Azerbaijan um, in in the naming that he uses, with a few of them coming from Damascus, from Cairo, from Mecca, from Jerusalem, and he further notes a preponderance of the religious disciplines being represented. Um, 
and then a large number of manuscripts from a particular library, which he goes on to discuss in more detail and its significance for um, the study of living living tradition and and um, and Sufi uh, uh, practices and ideas and and this library is represented by what he calls an ex libris of and and Ahmed bin Mustafa the Adin al Khalidi that is from the, the lock seal of the Gumshanavi endowment. And indeed, we can see um, an example of this in the short catalog edited by um, Khalidov. Um, there's an image of one of these manuscripts with the uh, Gumshanavi seal. So we can follow the narrative of the Gumshanavi manuscripts being plundered from Baybar through to Tbilisi to St. Petersburg, not to mention London and Ann Arbor, and clearly the, manus the manuscripts of many other collections were taken as well. So do we find them in still other contemporary collections? Can, is there more recovery in assembly? Assembly we can do before recovery. I don't want to pretend that recovery is this simple. It's not. So if we look, we can find them. So further traces. At some point in this gathering, collecting, salvaging, um, this removal, this dispersal of these historical collections from this tortured region, we see this purple stamp appear. Uh, I remember when we were first working on these manuscripts, there was a dispute among us. Is this a rabbit? Is this, what is this animal? <laughs> and I really like, uh, Torsten Wallin has settled on Steinbach, this kind of ibex with very long um, horns. <laughs> but it certainly appears to be in full stride. It's galloping, it's running. Um, so running goat, gazelle, Steinbach, I mean, it is apparently applied to each manuscript volume, along with a numeral that you see here um, in purple pencil. Um, and I've selected this manuscript, it's very interesting because it also includes a Cyrillic inscription that indicates the contents. This is Tafsir Abu Saud. Uh, so um, almost all the Tiflis manuscripts at Michigan have this. There are only two that don't, um, and there may be, again, there may be loss, maybe the reason that they don't. The stamp can also be found in manuscripts that are now part of other collections, um, notably at SOAS and at the University of Heidelberg. So um, this is entirely thanks to the labor of our colleague, um, Dominique Ahunschwab, who um, worked on the, the manuscripts at SOAS, so it's incre incredible provenance uh, work with them very much from a decolonialist frame. Um, and um, she has established that these were apparently acquired mainly by purchase from the trustees of the British Museum in the early 1940s. Um, at least one of them, so here's an example. Uh, this is where you can see the stamp and the number, and then you can see a rock seal. And this is the Erzinjani uh, rock library represented there. So one of them actually uh, came from the from Brown, um, and he indicates in a very detailed note that he had purchased it from the trustees of the British Museum <laughs> in 1923 for 14 pounds, um, which is a lot more than the University of Michigan paid. And also, um, if you'll notice, this is in Persian. And from what I understand, we it seems that that more of um, the materials in in, um, in Persia and in Turkish went elsewhere. They um, and and many of them, several of them, apparently um, to so us. Um, so these traces suggest that the manuscripts had also come from those pressed by the mu pressed on the museum by the Foreign Office again. The uh, purple step and the Erzinjani rock and so forth. And it is notable that the manuscripts were acquired at, by at SOAS during the tenure of Barnett, who actually, after he left the British Museum, he retired, he went to SOAS and was librarian there for a, <laughs> a, a stretch. Um, and so he had been, however, at, at the universe, at the museum, presumably when the Tiflis manuscripts were received, and then of course was involved in offering the selection that was made and ultimately acquired by Michigan. Um, at least two Mishanavi manuscripts have been recognized 
uh, at SOAS, thanks to Dominic's labor as well. So we see the further reaches of the dispersal of the um, Gumush Hanavi um, library. Um, across collections into Heidelberg, um, there are manuscripts at Heidelberg that seem to bear similar traces. Um, one is this manuscript, which, oh, actually, um, I have the image here, which has the same copyist as a manuscript in the collection at Michigan, and, and the hand is recognizably <laughs> distinct. Um, so here is the um, Ibex stamp. And then searching uh, Colomos, uh, the, the new Colomos portal, you can actually see that there are additional manuscripts um, with, this, with this stamp, including one that appears to be from the Gumash Hanavi uh, library. So thank you for your patience uh, in the, and your attention. Um, in the Tiflis collection, then, we seem to have manuscripts gathered, plundered, salvaged, removed, and dispersed from Osranina or Eastern Anatolia. In the midst of the um, conflict, the campaign of the war, um, and also um, the, uh, the wake of the genocidal campaign inflicted on the local Armenian community. So a very uh, fraught um, situation. But we also have incredible traces of earlier collecting, the exchange of scholars, of study, of learning, of devotion, and there is still so much to explore, which I implore you to, <laughs> to join me in doing. So thank you. I will, um, I will stop with this. Um, I will conclude with this very compelling quote from an anonymous uh, writer. Um, though Noor, <laughs> hi Noor, um, was I believe editor of this <laughs> of this particular issue of the uh, Roots and Roots. <clears throat> so, um, consider what models of heritage might be if power were not so readily and totally vested in the unhappy alignment of state power and privileged wealth. Heritage isn't neutral or easy, and that holds us true for objects or books being restituted to their countries of origins. The process cannot stop there. As the Delhi Collection's bloody awkward position, bloodily awkward position shows, restitution is not necessarily even desirable in practice, frustrating though that may be. There is a terror of transparency in most large institutions and a horror of discussing in public anything that might be controversial. Any admission of complicity to be deprecated at all costs, even when it kills any hope of actually proving honest, worthwhile stewards of the heritage mounded up within their walls. Controversial here means simply anything that embarrasses the status quo or forces any kind of consideration beyond that. Even narratives of restitution and recognition are treated with a bloodless kind of distance, if at all. Why should books remain the privilege of a few? What is the point? For whom, at some distant point, are we preserving them? A public lending library may actually serve a broad mass of people. A special collections library? I remain skeptical. A university research library? All cloistered? Ditto. The onus is on all these institutional arcs of past power and past wealth to clearly articulate what good, if any, they serve, not to presume to some unearned moral and scholastic authority. I'd rather see a book in hand with someone sitting in a park or riding a train or really almost anything than pinned down in a glass vitrine or left inside a closed door and only allowed out for handling by the few. Books are there to be read and handled and circulated. There is a static kind of death intrinsic to any special collections library is a scholar's exploration of an author's milieu worth any more than the pleasure of a single reader's enjoyment? As a despairing historian friend once noted, when you know that your life's work may be read closely by, say, 20 people, you do begin to wonder, what is the point in keeping books within a library that simply makes incarnate injustices unaddressed and barely acknowledged and then pretends to some kind of saintly purity of purpose? Thank you.
Thank you for that, Evan. Should we move to uh, our discussion now? Oh, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Let's do. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm just having some internet problems. That's why I'm a bit all over the place and I have to um, apologize for being a bit late. And, um, but yes, thank you for that wonderful talk. Let me turn my video on. Thank you for that wonderful talk and concluding with the quote from the anonymous author, who is not me, actually. <laughs> um, but I endorse everything in that quote. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk uh, immensely. And um, it's really a pleasure to see, I mean, first of all, uh, this very rich untangling of a very complex history of a collection. And it's also really heartening to see across the wider field of, of kind of Islamic manuscript studies that there's now this attention to kind of disentangling questions of provenance and the, the different myths of provenance, um, you know, and, and kind of attempting to set the record straight. Um, so yeah, I would just love to hear first off about um, kind of what inspired you to, to go down this particular path of research. Um, and then I have lots more questions. Um, oh, and my laptop is of course dying on top of all of my other internet problems. So go ahead and answer while I plug it in, please. <laughs> Yeah, oh my goodness. I mean, there's a there's a lot that's um, that sort of influenced and moved me in this direction. I, I I tried to point to some of the scholarly work at the beginning, um, and I will point to it again. I'm colleagues in um, in archival sciences have been have been wrestling with these ideas very eloquently and very powerfully for for a long time and I find that work very inspiring. Um, but also, I mean, <laughs> my, my encounters with, um, with folks for whom the manuscripts are significant um, in many different ways, in many different dimensions, that's also ex extremely compelling and extremely inspiring. Um, and then also, um, yeah, colleagues who, um, <sighs> Are, are not afraid <laughs> of burning it all down, as it were, you know, kind of um, being very direct and, and very, um, yeah, forthcoming with um, what, what they're trying to pursue in their own work. So, yeah, I mean, not to mention that having cataloged the collection and been sort of immersed in the collection, um, it's, it, it was extremely difficult for me not to just become, you know, enthralled. Um, so, but of course, um, that that level of cataloging requires a serious investment, you know, of time, and um, and one has to look outside. Very often, has to look outside um, what appears within the manuscripts themselves to be able to make sense of. <clears throat> of what's of what's there um, but yeah but there are also some other really important sources for again how to make sense how to, how to make sense of things beyond um traditional um sort of european academe you know approaches to um you know to, to work with manuscripts Wonderful. Yeah. And I love the point that you made, um, which is something that I've come across in my own work, kind of trying to disentangle the provenance of manuscripts and looking at, you know, kind of excavating like layers of cataloging that happened. Um, is this, you know, very colonial assumption that the that scholarship on Islamic manuscripts is something that only happens in Western countries, right? It's not, right? It's not something that the actual scholars who generated the manuscripts and the traditions that then trained the scholars after them are, are you know, um, kind of equipped to deal with when it's just such a, a, a kind of uh, a bizarre, I mean, when you look at it, you know, from a decolonial perspective, obviously, it's such a bizarre and counterintuitive assumption, right? <laughs> you know, so it was good to, yeah, yeah, it was, and it was fascinating to see that occur um, in your research as well on the Ottoman Empire, which is something I've seen in, in, you know, the South Asian context as well, which is a much more kind of um, blatantly colonial context. But just, you know, kind of going back to the collection itself, um, which was which was really uh, 
fascinating. And then we can maybe talk a bit more about the the kind of the whole history of provenance and the way it moved around. Um, in terms of the collection itself, I was kind of fascinated to see from the perspective of social history, the possibilities that it offers um, oh, yeah. in terms of, you know, reconstructing an intellectual community or even uh, the social life of a, of a community, right? Because you have births recorded and, um, you know, I mean, it seemed like, uh, you know, there's, there's like a, a very interesting way to look at the way that, uh, you know, manuscripts are being copied and circulating at the same time as like families are coming into formation. And I was just wondering if, uh, you know, that was kind of on your radar as something to, to research. It would be, you know, obviously a very different approach to the way that manuscript libraries are currently studied, which is very much, you know, looking at titles and reconstructing, you know, who copied what. And um, I just wondered if, yeah, maybe there was like a, a social history dimension to this collection uh, that you'd be interested in pursuing. Absolutely, absolutely. When I can spare the space, when my when my two kids will allow me the space. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, I find that endlessly fascinating. I mean, and to be able to venture in to think about how the how the manuscripts were were appreciated and how they were experienced and what what they meant to these folks who were who were annotating them, not to mention, you know, compiling them and 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 um exchanging them and engaging with them in all sorts of ways but um but but um who were they and and how um how how did they you know sort of how did they sort of come together around the manuscripts and what what representation of them exists perhaps you know and i mean in terms of in terms of the record you know <laughs> um you know in in these um in these volumes right like i think it would be a massively fascinating project i do think it would be challenging um but it would be i, but I mean so it is with um with many of these notes trying and it requires it requires i think scale right so to be able to have a you know sort of sufficient number of notes be able to assure yourself okay this hand is the hand of so and so um and then um, working out, you know, who they are and um, where, when, what other sources you may be able to find um, something about them. Um, so yeah, I mean, that would be an amazing project. And I encourage anyone who does have the space now, <laughs> including your good self. <laughs> I think it would, I think it would be amazing. Mm, 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 yeah, just to look at that, that. I mean, you know, because there are a lot of projects going on right now. Um, including one that that I wanted to do and um, just don't have the time to. So again, if anyone's listening and wants to take on these ideas, <laughs> like please do. I saw a lot of friends in the audience and and you know participants who are uh, you know very much part of the Islam wider community of, of Islamic manuscript scholarship. So please you know pitch in with your questions and and ideas in the chat, please. Um, you know especially you know when working on collections like this where you're trying to do some kind of perhaps prosopographical studies or to map the way that, you know, that manuscripts circulated across a geography or, or you know, moved through time. Um, it really, you know, has to be a collaborative effort. So please jump in in the chat, anyone. I mean, I, you know, in particular, I saw like certain, um, the purple pencil, for instance, is something that in conversation with a number of colleagues uh, at SOAS or, you know, other places, um, I think Boris, uh, librarians as well, also came across this purple pencil as uh, kind of being indicative of, of like one particular dealer and particular paths of, um, you know, of the way that manuscripts, uh, oriental manuscripts traveled. So I feel like, you know, there's sort of huge, um, I mean, huge collaborative projects that we need to, to work on. But yeah, in terms of the kind of social life and social history of manuscripts and the way that they're situated in, in kind of the life histories of the people who wrote and read and copied them um yeah i think that would that would be a wonderful project if anyone's interested but um yeah so uh well, jake may have jake may have a hand up oh do we okay sorry i'm being a bad moderator let me oh, see no. the <laughs> participants ah uh, okay here we are attendees jake has his hand up um jake do you want to um uh, can I allow Jake to speak? Talking permitted. Yes, okay, you're unmuted, Jake. Please jump in. 
wonderful uh, presentation. I very much appreciate it. Um, I must comment that you have disabled your chat, so nobody seems to be able to submit any questions. So if you somehow un, uh, enable the chat, maybe perhaps your participants can submit questions. Oh, thank you. That's very useful to know, Jake. <laughs> no oh. wonder the chat has been so quiet. OK. Um, thank you, Jake. How do we how do we enable the chat? I don't know. Could our colleagues at Anamed maybe help us with that? Because um, I actually am not sure how to do that either as a panelist. Very sorry for that. I was not aware uh, of it, obviously. Um, yes, it's done. OK. OK, I'm great. Very Amazing. sorry. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot that's, of people. That's the, the first audience. time it's happening. So oh, no sorry from home, everyone. <laughs> Since I have you, if I may, I really appreciated your uh, uh, discussion of these um, elaborate um, acquisition networks and also some of these dealer networks. I think some one of the things that I, I personally have been uh, uh, running into some walls with are some of these uh, early, late 19th century and early 20th century antiquities dealers who also dabble in manuscripts. Um, you mentioned the Egyptian dealer. I couldn't quite hear the name. Um, and I've found sometimes references, but I, I found also some very sporadic things. And I, I just keep drawing a lot of questions. Ah, thank you so much, uh, Robin. Nahman. Okay, I couldn't quite hear the last name. So, um, you know, so there's, but I, it would be so nice if we could have, I don't know, just a reference to some of these, uh, what I would call domestic dealers in the markets in Istanbul and Cairo and you know uh, Delhi and so on because we are seeing them I'm uh, in my own work at the Rylands very different uh, milieu and everything but you know I am trying my best to document things like prices um, and uh, you know anytime we see those notations um, and and now it, with triple IAF it's great you can you know link to uh, the triple IAF um, um, Part of the folio in the image and uh, and feature that more more discreetly. So that's that's really nice. But um, I just I would just call for more references like this because I think we have a lot of knowledge about Europeans again and again this Eurocentric kind of uh, dealer um, and uh, sale network. We know about the auction houses, all of these things. But when it comes to who's operating in these different centers, there's definitely a lot of commercial activity and yet it's really tough to pin down the various booksellers at the various times. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. I don't know, Evan, if you want to respond a bit um, or uh, shall we? Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, there's a great deal more to, to be done with um, yeah, unraveling, unraveling those stories, really important where we, where we have, um, expertise and space and support. And thank you, Jake, for the labor that you're doing, the Rylands, to document these things, um, that it's really important that we do so that, again, we can together start to, to draw out more of the stories. Um, and thank you, Robin, for, for mentioning Nachman. I know you're very familiar with him. Um, and I was just thinking about the fact that um, Iman Abdel Fattah has a, has a piece, a contribution on Nahman that she uh, published recently. Um, so. Yeah, we could put a link to it in the chat maybe. I love her work in general. She always chooses mm -hmm. topics, <laughs> very, very interesting topics. So yeah, I would love to read that. But yeah, oh, oh amazing. Look at that, Bruno, thank you, yeah. Um, brilliant. Yeah, I was wondering why the chat was so quiet because, like, the audience, <laughs> you're, you're very, you're a very lively group. So I was like, where are the? <laughs> so yeah, it's lovely to see many of you. Um, well, great. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, and everyone, please feel free to, to jump in in the chat. I feel like we can just go ahead and open it up. I obviously have more, can ask Evan endless questions um, I, I, and, you know, draw endless parallels with, with the collections I've worked on. And um, one thing I found particularly interesting in uh, your unweaving of the provenance was the ascription of the library to um, Abdul Hamid, I think, the second, that somehow, which I've encountered as well, like sort of by somehow ascribing a looted collection to a royal library. Either, I mean, I don't know if it's purely 
um, you know, a kind of marketing uh, attempt by the dealer to make it more, um, you know, attractive to sell to institutions, or if it's the institution that's doing that to, um, you know, make it, uh, make it seem more acceptable somehow that, you know, so I don't know, I'd love to hear your comment on that, because I encountered something very similar with, with the Delhi collection, obviously, and I was very intrigued to see that there's a parallel with, with this uh, Tiflis collection that you're working on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's something, it's something um, I would appreciate to hear your insights on. I mean, I'm, I think I'm completely with you that at least for the university, um, it, it was a means of, um, how to say, recognition of what they would consider this awful term, authenticity, <laughs> you know, because here they are, it's, it's mentioned a number of times in the correspondence, these things are being faked in large numbers, you know, they're really concerned that they're going to be pulled, you know, pulled one over, like, the, you know, that, um, basically they're going to be duped um and so um it's interesting though that with such an outlandish <laughs> or what feels like an outlandish claim they would be prepared to 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 accept that um mm -hmm. i think part of it was the um the narrative it was a it was a rich um a rich and, and complex narrative that he came out with although the ending point was actually someone called halas pasha Mm -hmm. um and still working out i think what we actually should hear from robin if robin has worked out anything else on who this carlos pasha is um i heard from a, a from a colleague uh last summer or, or the summer before who is working on de marinas de marinas was kind of the intermediary in that um in that whole um saga um who he had, De Demarinus had, again, to, to Jake's comment, sort of folks in Istanbul that he regularly, um, that he regularly worked with um, to source manuscripts. Um, and then, you know, from there could, could prepare and, and um, sort of pass them along. And, and the tale is sort of that this was done with, with an eye for Pierpont Morgan, and then he fell ill and died and his son wasn't prepared to to continue and it was a massive massive expense and Nachman um sort of took it on um I, I suppose getting the sense that he could um that he that he really could succeed in um in selling it and placing it at an institution I mean um there is also something about that moment <laughs> they were just ravenous appetites mm. um and I know there, I'm sure there are many factors that were influencing why um, why the institutions that were sort of inserting themselves felt felt permission to do so. But um, in any case, um, yeah, it's a very odd it's a very odd trope. Um, yeah. Very very but, fanciful, very fanciful yeah. as well, right? You know, yeah. sort of like uh, in, I mean, you know, I think because in the case of the British Library as well, I feel that the whole construction of, oh, this is the collection of the Mughal Library, when very similarly to your collection, the Delhi collection seems to be, a, you know, make, made up of smaller scholars, libraries, and very similar to yours, of, of kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Islamic scholars working libraries. Um, it's very interesting that it seems to actually be the institutions themselves that are generating these fanciful narratives about you know, uh, royal libraries and Abdul Hamid II and the Mughal court in order to, I don't know if it, it, it must be linked with some kind of, you know, Orientalist imaginary that was, um, you know, kind of ascendant at the time in order to maybe, you know, justify the creation and, and scholarship on these collections. So um, it's, so it's fascinating to watch it unravel now, <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> really, really satisfying. <laughs> yeah, very satisfying. And I think it goes back to this question that, you know, you mentioned in the, the piece that you quote at the end about the terror of transparency. I thought this was such a great, very poetic phrase and very poetic way of um, 
uh, you know, of, of describing uh, what many institutions are going through, right? Many collecting institutions are going through right now is a terror, a terror of transparency. And, you know, the fact that if you, you know, you, you deconstruct or you lift the, you know, the, the mask off of this one aspect of the collection, then, you know, kind of the whole, <laughs> the whole thing can, can kind of tumble the whole construct. Um, yeah, and I mean, and there's also, um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this too. There's also kind of at the other, at the other extreme, there's the danger of like um, performative mm. <laughs> sort of deconstruction or or totally, yeah. decolonizing or whatever it might be, mm. where you can you can say whatever you like, you know, and and yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and and think all kinds of fanciful thoughts, but. Mm. Is the reality changing? I mean, in terms of how the manuscripts or the materials are accessed, or where they're where right. they're no, not where really. they're yeah, sort of <laughs> it's or... not is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. so well, I mean, one thing I can say, I agree with you. I think the reality isn't isn't changing in the ways that we would like it to. But I do one thing I do feel is that if we um, have enough of these studies that disentangle the provenance and the history of these collections, it might, you know, might eventually lead towards some kind of shift. I mean, certainly the way that things are being studied is changing and the way that we're writing about them is changing, um, and which is a very exciting development. But, you know, I mean, I guess the other question is like, right, you know, and going back to the article that you quote at the end, this idea that, you know, the special collection of the university library is a very rarefied space um you know that that claims to give access but doesn't really give access to anyone except for a very rarefied group of people which is us right let's be honest uh, it's you know other yeah. PhDs and scholars of Islamic history and people who have access to these spaces but it doesn't give it doesn't really you know democratize or decolonize anything right so what I mean the, I guess the question is and maybe this is a question for you and for the wider group is is um you know, what would that look like? And why, and why is it, and like, why, what are the stakes? Like, why is it worth achieving? I, I've become very cynical about these things because I think, you know, some of the <laughs> institutions, you just, you know, it's very difficult to, to, shift, uh, to shift things in any meaningful kind of uh, practical way, right? So okay. I, I don't know, yeah. I feel like, I, I, you know, what, what, would, what would the ideal circumstance or the, um, you know, for interacting with, these collections look like, given the realities that we have in terms of structures and institutions. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think we need to be asking the, the folks of the communities who see belonging in the materials oh, yeah. <laughs> and understanding more, um, and understanding more, I mean, if, if we ourselves are part of those communities or if we're, if, you know, where, wherever we are in terms of our positionality. And then I'm very much mm -hmm. with you and I'm very much with, with Sandy Grant on this like, you know rejecting the universe like it, it has to be adjacent it has to be in these other kind of um mm -hmm. you know either underground or adjacent like spaces <laughs> yeah. um and where we we basically do what we can and and push out um push out of the of of the um you know this this sort of standard what we can imagine I think the trouble is like a, what we need to do that as I said is um is to be led by, um, yeah, led by folks other than ourselves in terms mm -hmm. of what actually makes sense. Sure. Um, and it's not for us to kind of come up with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that requires listening and that requires like a shift in the power dynamic that we actually respect the ideas mm -hmm. of these folks that don't have the privilege that we do and that we um, actually defer to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So still, I mean, still something I'm always, always thinking about. Mm -mm -mm. Um, yeah, and trying, trying to, trying to take action on where I can. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Absolutely, yeah. We're grappling with institutional structures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, um, yeah, hmm. they're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> so. As much as we might hope, yeah. No. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Feel free to raise your hand, or, or and I can we can unmute you, and, or just pop your question in the chat. Um, I can obviously keep chatting with Evan about her research uh, for another hour, but we'd like to <laughs> hear from you as well, Evan and Noor. Uh, you have to run. Oh, thank you for coming, Torsten. Uh, it's lovely to hear from you. Um, 
and uh, thanks for your kind words. It looks like Asuman has a question. Let's yes, see. thank you, Torsten. <laughs> Asuman, hi, Evan. Thank you for this. Uh, okay, thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, I might be confused. Would you please correct me if I am wrong? According to Ted uh, Avitisian, 4,000 manuscripts were saved from Erzurum, Van Mus, etc. Held in Tiflis and Michigan University, purchased over 163 manuscripts. Does it mean that the rest of the collection in Tiflis is still waiting to be explored in terms of metadata, digitization, etc.? Thank you so much for the your kind words, Asuman, and for the question. So to my knowledge, the manuscripts that were collected have ended up, have have reached, have 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 been taken to to various places. Um, and to my knowledge, the only manuscripts from that removal that that have have reached Michigan are the 163. The university did acquire, and Kelsey was involved, Armenian manuscripts that were being offered um, by a particular dealer, um, and that also there there was an interest in rescue and salvage under under the circumstances. Um, uh, but I don't know the precise um, of of the top of my head. I don't know the precise origin of those manuscripts, or if they were if they were uh, spirited out. Um, by um, by him um, in his effort or or how they came, but they are very few in number, and the rest of that very large number are elsewhere. Um, so, <clears throat> to the extent they are, you know, not legendary. Um, so, great. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Um, Thank you so much, Evan, about your excellent observation on performative decolonization. Yes, I, I agree, thank you, Evan. <laughs> I am forever grateful to you for bringing back our institutional dynamics. Are you planning to also research uh, or do research that will shed light on the valuation of these manuscripts like John Saylor's article on the Imperial Mughal Library? And that's a question from Lila Dar from UC Berkeley Library. Thank you so much again for your kind words, too, too generous. And thank you for, um, some, for the suggestion. Um, I, um, I don't feel that the valuation is really within my, my realm of, of expertise. Um, in terms of documenting pricing and so forth within the manuscripts, there is, there is very little um, uh, that I have observed, but I may have missed. I may, certainly may have missed something. And it's, um, again, it's something that feels a little bit beyond me. So it's, it's, it's not something I've considered pursuing, but it would be an amazing project. And there may p potentially be, again, within what I have missed, um, there may be some, some fruit for that in the, um, in the collection. Certainly there is fruit for that outside of the Tiflis manuscripts. Uh, in the other manuscripts at Michigan that I can speak for, and um, I'm I'm sure Robin can speak for what she has observed in in the the labor that she did to to work on them. Um, so, uh, but within the Tiflis, I'm not I'm not so sure. But it's it sounds really um, sounds really compelling. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, okay, and lovely. Um, Thank you, Evan. <laughs> Salam, and thank you to <laughs> Very nice to hear from you. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, yeah, and, and anyone else, feel free to jump in. I, I'll just keep asking Evan stuff, and then um, feel free to just keep putting comments in the chat, and we'll keep going like that. Um, another couple of things I wanted to talk with you about, Evan, while we wait for uh, comments to come in. Um, the link with the establishment of the Turkish National Library and not just the <laughs> Turkish national. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. And I would actually say the, the, the relationship between the looting of manuscripts or the removal of manuscripts from their original circumstance with the creation of a lot of national and university libraries. So like even the, again, the British library, which is my um, you know, area that I, I know the most about in terms of collection formation, um, you know, the Asian Africa collections, which are enormous are formed from uh, the British Museum and the India Office collections, both of which are derived from colonial collecting, we would call it collecting, colonial practices of manuscript removal, um, that went on to form a national library which was only legislated in 1972. So it was a relatively recent national library in the UK. 
built upon you know these materials that were that were removed um, under you know through colonial violence and um, and what's, what I also find interesting is the connection with the university libraries in the US the way that they're almost offshoots uh, of this of these practices right like this cooperative purchase via the British Museum to you know and I, I'm sure there would be a lot of examples like this the way that these you know these the, the formation of these collections that present themselves as being very um you know official and institutional and for scholarship and you know now are, are sort of uh, beacons of of um you know kind of governmentality and respectability that their origins uh all seem to be in 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 quite dubious circumstances so i was just wondering if you know uh if this is a topic that that maybe as a field we should be exploring a bit more in the sense of like the the actual like construction of the authority of the library as a you know, as a source of access to knowledge. Um, so yeah, please, <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, I think you're muted again. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm all for new conceptions of the library mm -hmm. <laughs> and also for how knowledge is made and, and kept and, and circulated. <laughs> yeah, really, really interested in, um, yeah, in, in other, other, other approaches to that. Um, but no, completely with you. I mean, and there's so many imperialist legacies and they're also the imperialist le legacies that one, that are, that are the more sanctified, you know, like um, like the Ottoman Empire, for example, <laughs> or, um, you know, other, other sort of historical situations where it feels like, okay, once it's so far removed, there's something kind of, you know, permissible about it or, um, or somehow it, um, it's a, a little less salient to our, you know, consciousness. But even, um, you know, even at, at our university, our Tame Public University, I mean, there's such a heritage. Actually, being very closely involved with um, the U.S. imperial interests in the Philippines. I don't know if you knew that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and and you know, there was very deliberate and targeted, um, you know, sort of re uh, really, really. Um, really ugly, you know, sort of objectifying and, and mm -hmm. othering um, in terms of what was collected, what was being studied and how the studying was, you know, how it was approached, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I feel like we all have, we all, I mean, it's, it's, we all have, we all have that legacy. Um, and within the, you know, within this set of, of institution, within this, yeah. you know, academic structure. And it's, I think it's unfortunate to see um, how how we propagate ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely here for um, you know for approaching things differently, and and um, yeah, I think it um, I think it helps when we we try and disrupt some of the I mean because we got capitalism to deal with too, so. <laughs> to disrupt yeah, some, really, of, exactly. some of the, mon the monetary incentives. Those are really, really hard to pull people yeah. away from. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But before um, we induce too much of an existential crisis in the audience. Oh yeah, let's, wanted to... yeah let's, give people some, let's give people some space. Yeah, let's give people some hope as well, right? <laughs> you know? yeah. I wanted to ask specifically about the Gumish uh, Hanavi uh, manuscripts. Um, and whether, uh, again, like what kind of conclusions can be drawn about that particular set of libraries in terms of, you know, the construction uh, of knowledge in that period and in that context, because I feel like one very interesting thing about this collection, you know, for better or worse, in terms of how it moved around the world and its provenance is that, you know, it can be studied very interestingly as this kind of microcosm of an intellectual world in, in Anatolia in the, you know, in the, uh, I think it was 17th and 18th centuries. So were there any particular trends or conclusions that you could draw about kind of knowledge production in that uh, geography based on uh, some of these collections? Not yet. <laughs> that is the work in progress. <laughs> very much interested in that, very much hoping to do more with that. Um, but also I invite anyone else, again, who has the space and the interest to join me in, in working on those manuscripts to be looking for that, looking for that seal. Um, and yeah, and, and, and sharing, um, you know, sharing our our findings right like mm -hmm. I so I do have like I said I have a I have a 
her data set and I will be sharing um, because our, you know, again, limitations of cataloging, um, our cataloging system is extremely fraught. It's extremely difficult to get a lot of, to, to address a lot of these questions within our, um, within our data structure. So that basically was necessary to like pull the data and then, and then massage it. So to speak. that's an awful word, but you know, uh, <laughs> work on it. Find trends in it. Yeah, get yeah, it yeah. into shape. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, um, and I will be sharing that when I get it into a into a state when I get all the errors and the typos and everything sort of corrected, um, where it's not misleading someone. I will I will deposit it in that institutional repository, so so anyone else can um, can work with it. Because I'm completely with you. I mean, as as a as a as a microcosm, as the history of these particular communities who are mm. significant in and of themselves. Mm -mm. Um, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful like window. Mm -hmm. So it's there is so much there, so much there. Um, yeah, and it's great, and it and it kind of directs the scholarly eye away from Istanbul as an imperial knowledge center, right? I mean, it's it's a great resource for for studying kind of what was going on in you know in Anatolia intellectually during this period. So, I guess that's one for the Ottomanists, Ottoman intellectual historians to take up. Um, we have a comment in, from Samar uh, Mikati to everyone. Uh, thank you for your nice eye-opening lecture. Uh, you've made me interested to study the collections of manuscripts in the American University of Beirut, um, which has come from local scholars' libraries, which gives another version of the story of Oriental collecting. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I, yeah, and I would love to hear more about that as well, like the history yeah. of kind of antiquarianism and Oriental collecting in the Middle East is, you know, uh, has a lot more layers to it for sure. So I would Absolutely. Love can't, thank you so much for that, Summer. I can't wait to, can't wait to hear more on your work. Please share it with us when you, when, when yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. When you absolutely. feel ready. Yeah, and please be in touch <laughs> as well. You know, you can share methods and approaches. So let's see, if anyone, and also uh, for those of you in the audience, feel free to raise your hand if you'd prefer to like ask your question out loud rather than typing it. Um, we're very happy to uh, talk as well. So yeah, so it's very exciting. And also in terms of like the construction, what, one question I guess I have is about the fact that um, all of these manuscripts, except for 30 of them you said, have a waqf uh, stamp or inscription yeah. on them, right? Uh, so I just wonder what the, yep. if you have any notion or sense of how they traveled out of the waqf and then what the implications were for the waqf and if, are there still implications today in terms of the, you know, construction of those libraries or, or the manuscripts? I mean, do, do any of those waqfs still exist even? I mean, that could be the case. So... I don't know, have you, is it something you've managed to look into it from like the waqf angle? Like what's like mapping them onto? I'm very interested. I'm very yeah. interested in that angle. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I, I would love to work with a colleague with deeper knowledge on, mm. on that. Um, mm. And I'm still kind of waiting my way, getting, getting deeper and, and again, work in progress, you know, something pursuing that. But I will say what is very interesting, I tried to hint at this, um, and I know there was a lot in the presentation, um, but um, some of them moved from one walk in the collection to another, right? Mm -hmm. So especially the the Janet Zade, Abdullah Adib, and the Gamish Hanavid, well, but mainly Janet Zade, um, was was acquiring from other apparently dissolved um, walk. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean collections. However, they had been established. Whether they were, whether there was a physical library, or whether it was another um, legacy, mm -hmm. um, because you can find the indication of both. I mean, it may be a complication of registration. You know that mm -hmm. that the, that the there was a there was an intention of a walk that was never mm -hmm. formally registered, and so. You know, it never became such a um, such an issue, but I mean, there is still an intention. So <laughs> I, don't, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, yeah something I I, um, I I do think a lot about. What are the implications of that, and also mm -hmm. um, what are the implications in terms of because something I think about a great deal when it comes to the 
the this the current custodianship of the manuscripts where do they belong and sort of to your question before like how to what 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 can we even imagine in terms of how how the manuscripts um could be appreciated and could be used um you know um have, having them out in the community loaning them mm. <laughs> like loaning them to you know to community members having them out for prayer um making sure that that they they can be you know they can be consulted but at the same time to another point that i that i think resonates very much with me also um again from this this re this reversal of privilege the skills that we've been able to cultivate uh, i mean paleography manuscript culture mm. like offering something of that as well and that's 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 of course you can say that but that is that is labor that is work and it's mm -hmm. and it requires time and it requires resources and it requires investment it requires more than just you know talk um and so thinking about what that can look like as well like in terms you know i think about um i think about residencies and i think mm -hmm. about um uh, uh, i mean all, all them all must be paid of course like post post back i know that they're the post back a program that has been proposed and various kinds of training opportunities to actually be with the materials, working with the collections mm -hmm. to develop those skills, because I'm sure you would say the same, much of what you gain comes with exposure. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't come from just I'm, one, <clears throat> a myriad of teachers is wonderful, mm -hmm. but it doesn't just come from hearing from yet another, you know, person yeah, yeah for comes, sure the the, the manuscripts are the true teacher right <laughs> yeah. yeah to be sure and being forced into you know those really naughty like troublesome questions that leave you like what? like what am I looking at mm. <laughs> you know um so anyway um yeah I know I got really far off the question that you asked but Vakafla are really interesting to me too I mean yeah. so where I was going is I mean the, the university will will not will not my, my 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 view is not fully aligned with the view of the university I'm not I'm not that concerned with holding on to things <laughs> so so if it no. turns out that there are you know Vox still um present and um and in if effect it would be amazing to mm. return something mm -hmm. that would be amazing yeah but and it's it's fascinating how the discourse around the return of items has evolved in the past like 10 15 years i mean yeah you know, when i started out like on like curating manuscripts it was unthinkable that anyone would ever mention such a thing you know and now it's become uh, possible to suggest and discuss which i think is, is a good and yeah exciting and that's a danger too i mean like i said it, the sexier it becomes you know the more the more skeptical to, to become of yeah. the intentions but um but yeah if there is an actual genuine mm. real community driven again way mm -hmm. not in the interest of the university like not to make the not to inflate the university sense right, of right, like right, right, self-importance right. and and mm -hmm. you know the white mm -hmm. savior's gift to mm -hmm. humanity yeah. um but yeah I mean, and I, like I said, that it requires it. It initially requires a lot of listening, um, mm. and inviting, um, in, in, inviting suggestion, inviting direction. It's not just mm. a suggestion; it's a direction. It's act, yeah, there's there's real power, and expertise and guidance behind it. So mm -hmm. um, there should also be compensation because it is it is labor, it is work. For sure. um, but yeah. Um, it is interesting. I'm with you. It's really interesting how the discourse has shifted. Mm. Shifted <laughs> massively, massively. Yeah, yeah. Over, over the, I mean, like we've been, I think we started at the same time, which is about 10 years ago and it's changed mm -hmm. completely. Like the, completely. the, the, the framework, the goalposts, like as curators, like as people who are responsible for collections and it's changed in, in really good ways. Um, and I hope we'll, we'll, we'll continue to evolve actually. Um, so, yeah. So, any more questions? I can keep asking. One last thing I wanted to ask about 
um, on, you know, from a historical perspective is, you know, we talked a bit about the British imperialist angle, the American imperialist approach to knowledge production, the Russian imperialist angle, I thought was very interesting that they were originally the ones who actually removed the manuscripts to, to Tiflis. Were you able mm -hmm. to um, make any inroads into understanding kind of what the motivations were in that or? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, part of this broader ethnographic you know, uh -huh. program. I mean, um, so so yeah, and also, I mean, the the large Orientalist um, project, which is very longstanding, very rich mm. contributions. Mm. I mean, um, and also, um, yeah, also in terms of what we were discussing before, res respect and recognition and engagement with local scholars, at mm. least at least acknowledging. <laughs> Yeah, just acknowledging local scholarship and 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 scholarly contributions, um, and and in some cases spiriting folks out, like po poaching them. I guess mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if it would. I'm you know I'm not sure. I'm really the one to be speaking to that and how it happened. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean it was very much um, this. Yeah, this this sort of ethnographic um impulse maybe imperialist yeah. superiority sort of yeah. approach yeah. like just you know to, to learn what they could I mean but also like I said it is this is what makes this to me extremely fascinating there was also massacre <laughs> you know taking place like it there there, there were yeah. So, mm -hmm. so what's so what's awful about that is mm -hmm. how one could exploit, you know, the salvage for other means. Like, does that mm -hmm. does that make it okay? <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean. Like, anyway, um, because they didn't just like where did they end up? I think the way you answer that question mm -hmm. is you asked, where did they end up? Yeah. You know, they didn't yeah. go back. They didn't. Re they didn't return. They didn't. They didn't return once things had calmed, and you know, they weren't. They weren't placed back. They. They went to. They went to. Um. You know, the Oriental echelons of. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, my my. I, I, have, <laughs> I, I have theories about this myself, which is that the. Please, I would love to hear them. <laughs> yeah. The, because you, you find the same thing in South Asia that you, you'll, you know, you'll have a massacre of humans at the same time as you have the, you know, sort of large scale removal of manuscripts. I mean, large scale removal of many types of wealth, right? But obviously yeah. I'm focused on, you know, uh, what I'm focused on. Um, and I see it as a conscious uh, attempt at, um, you that know. Version? Yeah, of cultural destruction and ending, you know, chains of knowledge and networks of knowledge and and a lot of, mm. um, okay, you know, uh, you know, destruction of of intellectual communities and and in many cases it's very conscious and it's it's actually a, a kind of stated policy of various imperialist armies. I, I don't know in this particular case of the Russian army in, in Anatolia. I can't say it's really not anything I know about, but um, in the context of South Asia, for sure. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting with this particular collection, so many different imperialisms had to uh, converge, right, to oh, kind yeah. of make this <laughs> make this collection happen, like from the Ottomans, the Russian, the British, American, it sort of is almost like a little, you know, a microcosm of, of 20th century cultural imperialism, you know, <laughs> sort of flowing, you know, along particular geographies and, and networks. Um, kind of embodied yeah. in the, the provenance of the Tiflis collection. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And now squelched into to still these other, <laughs> you know, these other places. So. Yeah. so I think we've got about five minutes left. So I think I should I should hand back over to uh, Daphne to do some concluding uh, comments, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, um, Thank you very much to both of you. Um, thank you, Evan, for this fascinating lecture. Um, and thank you, Noor, for, uh, for this very engaging conversation. Um, it helps a lot to, to understand the, the entire story. Um, and uh, and this, this talk, I think it was significant, not only to historians, but uh, also to librarians and archivists 
that show the yeah. importance of uh, like not only the importance of the material itself, but it's uh, re it's the story of its creation, but also the importance of the recent history of it. So thank you both for uh, putting this uh, this subject under uh, such light and uh, discussed it in such details. And then, dear audience, uh, first, I'm very sorry for the uh, miss setting of the uh, of of the chat uh, settings. Uh, I hope we covered it very quickly. We solved it very quickly. Um, and thank you very much to all of your questions. So our uh, Anamed Library Talks will continue in September. Uh, in September, we will go to the high tides, so another subject. Uh, so the next talk will be given by Nebahat Ilge Gerçek. And the title of her talk is the Kaska and the Northern Frontier of Hatti. So if you're interested, uh, you may check us on uh, on our social media, on the Med Library social media. And thank you very much ev to everyone once more. And have a have a good evening from Istanbul, or have a good day uh, from the US. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us.